Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. This is the second citizen uh, request so, uh, meeting of a city council subcommittee and the idea is to walk through a bit of the CIP process and then to discuss uh, the requests that we did receive. My name is Karen Connard. I'm the city manager here. Let me take a moment to let you all know who's sitting up here with me. Uh, to my right is uh, Abby Mills from our finance department. We also have Peter Britz uh, from Planning and Sustainability, Peter Rice from Public Works, Nathan Lunny and Zach McLaughlin from the school department. Andrew is a colleague of Abby's in the finance department. We also have counselors, uh, Rich Blaylock, John Tabor, Beth Moreau, and uh, city clerk uh, serving us tonight is June Philbrook. So welcome to tonight's conversation. We will give a brief, brief presentation for those of you who are less than familiar with how the CIP or the capital improvement plan works. We'll give a little bit of a primer on that and then we'll d dive right into the request that we received this year and um, the analysis we did so far. So let me take a moment to transition to the slides. So um, we will, uh, our goals for tonight will to, be, to give you that overview, to review the request, review the staff analysis, answer questions uh, in as informal a way as we can, and then to discuss next steps and recommendations to both the planning board and the city council. There we go. So uh, for those of you less than familiar with how this works, what is the capital improvement plan? It really is, um, as it say, says here, a multi-year financial and infrastructure planning tool. It, please remember it remains a plan. It's not a budget. It doesn't have money attached to it until such time as it becomes incorporated into the city budget. So it's uh, something that takes all year to, to produce. Just as soon as we've passed a budget, we're ready and looking forward to the next uh, round of, of all of these conversations. It includes six years of planning, and um, again, it's a plan. It's not. It doesn't have dollars attached to it. And the idea of this, of the plan itself, is to be as responsive and responsible to the citizens and to the staff who are helping to program how the monies get spent throughout the year. Um, a good point one of my colleagues likes to say is there are lots of great ideas in this plan. Not all of them rise to the top in any given year, and that's the challenge of both the planning board and the city council is to weigh those priorities and to think about competing interests for limited resources. So um, this co this kickoff of the CIP will culminate in a public hearing in February and adoption in March so that it then rolls into the city council budget for the following year. Why do we have a CIP? So the important thing of a CIP is it helps to identify needed capital improvements throughout the city. It helps guide the allocation of fiscal resources. It's a plan that we all follow for future city expenditures, and it ensures that needed facilities are provided within the city's financial capacity. It keeps us in check on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, overall, we look to maintain an accessible and inclusive planning process for our residents and for everyone who uses the services of the city. And um, with that, what actually makes it, uh, what makes a project eligible? What, what, could, what could you say that could qualify or determine something's eligible for the CIP? And these are the six boxes that we use, uh, at the lens through which we look through at projects. So does it involve construction or expansion of a public facility, street, or utility or infrastructure? Is it rehab of an existing facility that costs in, a, in excess of 50000 Does it involve design or planning study work related to the master plan? Is it an item or equipment, I think rolling stock, uh, not rolling stock, non-vehicular costing 50000 or more with a depreciable life? And uh, also included are the replacement and purchases of vehicles, we call it rolling stock, um, again with that $50,000 threshold. Lastly, uh, an item that is qualifying for a CIP element sheet would be land acquisition. So when we talk about how to fund these projects, uh, we have to adhere to the city's long-standing financial policies and there are two main ways to pay for a capital project. You can use general fund capital outlay, which is cash, think of it as cash, and pay as you go funding. And we typically no budget no more than 2% of the prior year budget for the cash portion of the CIP. And then when we speak about the debt, uh, we also look to follow the long-standing policy of not going over more than 10% of the budget in debt. So with that, here's the first slide on capital outlay or the pay as you go. It shows the chart of no more than 2% of prior year. We are pleased to share that um, 
in the current year that we're in, we kept the capital outlay percentage at 1.37%, and you'll see how that floats year to year. You'll notice a steep decline in 21 and 22 and 23, and that was um, certainly COVID-related, and what we tried to do in this current fiscal year is start to restore some of that cash capital outlay. Then we move on to the debt portion of this conversation. Um, again, keeping to the keeping our debt service level below 10% of our overall budget. And in FY24, we are at 7.74%, uh, uh, right about almost the same number as last year, which was 7.72. The goal here is to be stable and predictable and to stay within our limits. You'll see the box here, and this is typical for, let me move this. This is typical for a six-year outlook. <coughs> as we're in the current year and the few out years, it's, it's always staying below 10. As the projects build and rise and we, when we uh, factor in escalations of, of um, cost, you'll see this uh, creeping over 10 percent. We always bring it in, in under 10 percent as we move through a CIP, but this is a typical chart in the way that um, it is depicted. So um, something that this current council was intent on doing was uh, setting goals and then looking to have what we do on a daily basis uh, help them achieve those goals. And that's why this council last year started a process by which we had a more inclusive and public conversation about the citizen requests that we receive every year. Because, Abby, we've been receiving these since FY17. FY17. But we just started having this public info session and public outreach. And it, you'll see on this slide that it touches three of the seven city council goals that speak to um, inviting and honoring input, um, encouraging engagement, looking to enhance best practices of how to deliver uh, good government, and to consistently communicate with folks. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Peter Britt, who's going to speak to what we actually received this year and to help walk you through the analysis. You might want to grab your. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in terms of the numbers for this year from Citizens Request, we received a total of 95 submissions. Um, when you look at those submissions in total, there's a few that overlap. Um, we ended up consolidating them into 47 unique projects. Um, and the like, the submissions that were similar were grouped into, into these 47 projects. We divided the projects into six categories to talk about them tonight. And the six projects, six of the 47 projects are eligible for consideration. These are projects that were reviewed by city staff and are potentially eligible as future projects. 24 of the projects fall into the category of existing projects, so these submissions are found to be requests of projects that were already found in the capital, capital process or capital plan. Um, and then 17 requests were best suited for another process. They didn't really fit this model. The projects either did not meet the requirements for a CIP project or they need to go through a different project process in order to advance to a CIP. So um, for FY25, the, the 95, again, as, as I said, brought down into 47. I'll just break down the numbers a little bit here. Six of those CIP eligible projects fall into school infrastructure, parks and playgrounds, art, historic documents and artifacts. 24 other requests that were already in the CIP, are already in or an existing CIP project. And then 17 requests were determined to be better served by another process or board by staff. Um, either they're under the purview of another board committee or process, they're not city property, or it's not an appropriate capital request. And then the category with the eligible projects that we determined could be eligible for the CIP involves school infrastructure, parks and playgrounds, art and historic documents and artifacts. I'll come back to these specific projects at the, and, and we'll go through them in a little more detail. I'll just finish off the slideshow and, and we won't go into the detail until we're done going through all the categories. Um, again, 24, you can see quickly, already existing in the CIP are listed here and we'll talk about those more. And then the 17 that are better served by another process are shown here. So just to talk quickly about the next steps before we go into the details. Um, where does a citizen request go after this meeting? So the eligible projects, if they're rec recommended to move forward into the CIP, city staff will process it for a timeline and costing and funding options, and it'll be prepared and, pro and provided to the planning board and city council to be reviewed in the context of the full CIP with other CIP requests. If it's deemed for another process, then the interested parties are encouraged to submit request, project requests through that recommended channel, which will be talked about on each one. Um, and then existing projects, 
Many of existing projects had existed in the CIP sheet or on project web pages. Um, they're added, added to this report. Interested residents are encouraged to utilize these links and to review these additional, this additional information on the existing projects. And then all the CIP pro requests will appear in Appendix 1 of the CIP when it's put out for publication. Uh, just a, a snapshot of the timeline of the process and where we are. Um, we've gone through the kickoff in August, the resident submission process in September, staff submissions um, in October, and a project update, and then November 9th is where we are tonight. And then December 12th, the planning board will have a subcommittee, an advisory committee that reviews CIP projects. On December 21st, the full planning board reviews the CIP and then votes to recommend its adoption to the city council. And then in the winter or spring of 2024, the city council will review the CIP and hold a public hearing to adopt the final document. And then in the spring of 24, the final funded project list will be determined as part of the overall budget process. Let me um, just add something here that um, on December 4th, at the council's uh, first of its two December council meetings, it would be great to have a council rep give a report back on, on the, the findings of this group. It's too soon to do it, I think, for Monday's meeting, but that way we can notice it and, have it and share with the public what you all um, see as recommendations and comments that should be brought forth. So, um, Peter, do you want me to go back to the sixth yeah, page? Maybe the, the CIP eligible page, if you back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should we start with the school infrastructure? How do you? So we have uh, copies that are floating around this room, and we have extra copies up at the front table that will break these down by bucket. So the first bucket we're talking about is the six that have de been determined to be eligible in the CIP. So um, Peter's going to walk through that now, but you're welcome to come up and grab a copy because we won't be able to project it here. Uh, Peter's going to walk through them, and we'll talk by department, um, teeing up the school department folks first. Yeah, so the first one under school infrastructure is that air conditioning in public schools. We received a request for air conditioning to have centralized air in many of the classrooms. Um, I don't know how, I guess, go through all the details here, but. Um, hmm? Yeah. So um, this was a request to do that citywide in all schools. Um, there are times when the, when the temperatures are high. Um, air conditioning would, would um, require significant upgrades on that order of six to eight million dollars. Um, and at this point, the, the cost of that is so high that staff doesn't recommend putting it forward um, on those. I don't know if the school wants to speak more to it, um, but I can keep going through these. Or I, Yeah, I, I can just quickly, um, you know, we're, I would start with saying we're super appreciative of being in a community where the council emphasizes citizen uh, contribution. Uh, at the same time, uh, being in a, in a community where citizens then want to utilize that to improve the experience of their students uh, and staff. Uh, then we're in the unfortunate situation sometimes of, of then having to balance well, what are the, you know, the operational and financial considerations uh, of those requests. In this particular case with the two items uh, that are both connected to uh, air conditioning and a number of uh, citizens' requests, I think from our department, the way we look at it is, um, as you think about your 2% and 10% kind of guidelines, we assume that there is uh, only a certain amount of the, of the pie that it's going to be available for the schools. Uh, and as we look at what else is in the CIP, the offsets that we would need to make in order to um, take on this project, uh, we think, uh, are, are not offsets we want to do. Uh, that there are other things uh, connected to the delivery of instruction uh, and um, the operation of the schools uh, that are that are more important. We are unbelievably sympathetic. We've been in those classrooms. I've talked to those teachers and I've talked to those parents about those experiences that happened at the very beginning part of our year and the very end of our year. Um, but at this point, um, the, the number of days that are included and the impact it has on our, on our operations, we just don't feel we can justify uh, the expense and, and uh, lose those other things that are in the CIP. Why don't we jump to the third one? Yeah, the second one is very similar. Um, the third one is air purification in the schools. Um, so again, um, this is a request to have active air purification installed when the HVAC systems in the citywide in all public schools. Um, and this proposal 
um, would has a very specific <clears throat> project to do active pure, a, a brand type, a brand of purification that they mm -hmm. wanted to put in here, um, and the analysis that was done by the by the citizen who did this um, determined that there would be a cost savings um, through the reduction um, in substitute teachers and costs um, that would that would occur from that. Um, Essentially, a, a similar a similar problem here is the co really the cost, the high cost of it, um, and it's a commercial solution which the school department um, only has a little bit of knowledge about. Um, to, to, to spend 2.2 million dollars um, and 250,000 electrical upgrades and annual maintenance are projected to be 168,000 um, dollars. There are efforts ongoing now to do HVAC upgrades and efficiencies, and the proposed FY30. Funding will begin the process of value and upgrading the high school HVAC systems and anticipated career center in terms of uh, the final report. The school department will consider contemporary solutions throughout that process and may continue to consider implementing solutions like the one proposed as future renovations are completely completed throughout the district. Zach, Nathan, is there anything else you want to add? No, I, I think that summarizes it. I mean, the combination of a, of a single vendor um, that we'd be looking at, and in general, we understand the value of improved HVAC uh, going forward. Um, but outside of that, you know, uh, Peter to type once. Okay. Does it make sense to ask if people want to stop there? Because otherwise, yeah. these guys get to leave us. Ask a question. Sure. <laughs> It's your meeting. Um, <clears throat> I know you don't want us to probably spend the money, and honestly, it's a lot of money, $68 million, to put air conditioning in all the schools. How, is there a possibility of exploring the option and what the cost would be to maybe, in, if there's a certain side of the building that gets hotter because it gets more sun or something, of putting like portable units in maybe just those rooms or something like that? So the quick, uh, I'll give you the quick version, and then you can probably give a, a broader scope on this. But the, you know, we did some, um, we had the superintendent's experiment uh, this year, where I allowed um, folks in those couple of days uh, to um, bring in some some units into individual spaces, uh, and we're not in a position. Two, two things happened. One, our electrical wasn't up to the task, so we so that turned into teachers running back and forth to throw switches um, throughout the course of the day. Uh, and the the actual impact on temperatures was not that was not that great. I think people appreciated the fact we were trying to make an effort, uh, but in terms of uh, you know it, it was not a functioning solution in terms of what we're trying to do overall. Thank you. So, what other ways can we mitigate these super hot days? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great, it's a, it's a, I, I don't know that we have, I don't foresee us, um, we don't have a standard by which we would, some, some districts around us, or some districts in Massachusetts canceled school. Um, I, I, I worry about that as a, in terms of the reality of what that could be if we have a, a year where we have, you know, a couple weeks of time that's hotter than we would like it to be, what that standard would be by, by which we make those types of decisions. Uh, we don't have tons of good. I mean, we do things that you would have had when you were in school. We have fans, you know, we, uh, teachers tried to be thoughtful about, uh, about the types of activities that we're conducting. Teachers very often are taking students outside in certain situations. Um, during those days, um, and, and I hate to say this, but to a certain extent, we need to kind of tough out a few days on each end of the year. Uh, as we, and I know people have had conversations, you know, we continue to talk about kind of climate change and what that might look like. You know, I think we need to continue to explore, you know, monitor those trends over time, uh, and think about if, uh, you know, if, uh, if three or four days on each end becomes three or four weeks. At what point are we having a significant impact on learning loss, and, and does our analysis of the, of the need around some of these numbers change? We'll see, you know, as time goes on. Great, thanks. Um, just one question on the um, it's, it mentions that electrical service would need to be upgraded, and it said the estimated cost would be six to eight million. I'm just wanted some clarity on is that just the cost of the electrical, not including the cost of the HVC? You know what? Yeah. No, that's the that. that's the cost. So we. We've done the analysis a, a couple of times in my sh short four years looking uh, at ways that we might solve. And the numbers at uh, Dondero, let me, let, let me frame it if I may for 30 seconds, just say 
680,000 square feet in our schools here in Portsmouth, better than roughly 75%, I think I would say, are, is air conditioned. Well, we have air conditioning. You've been involved in that conversation in recent years at New Franklin Elementary, bounded on both sides by uh, highways and noise being an issue and air quality. That elementary school now is air conditioned for that reason, but the middle school has air conditioning. Most of Portsmouth High School has air conditioning, although there are elements there that we intend to address uh, starting in fiscal 30 uh, with um, a renovation project we expect on the CTE center there. It comes up on the list for state support and we see that all tied together for the synergies that we can find. Um, so what remains really is Dondero Elementary and Little Harbor mm -hmm. and, and of course the space at Sherburn School that we're vacating uh, now that we're working on the renovation over community campus. So both Dondero and Little Harbor have been reviewed. The numbers without electrical work ran roughly $2 million at Dondero and three plus at uh, Little Harbor. Now those numbers are a couple of years old. So adding in the, uh, adding in the costs of upgrading electrical service is where the facility team came up with that six plus million. So it's, uh, um, I, I will say to you that we are, we are pleased and grateful that all of our buildings have air handling. So even though we're not conditioning the air and in these two schools we're not modifying it, we're not dehumidifying even, we are in fact refreshing air, so we do have moving air, which when we faced the pandemic put us light years ahead of many districts around the state, so. Um, and just one other question. Um, I know obviously air quality is a concern now, especially after the COVID and post-pandemic. Um, like you mentioned that we do circulate the air in the schools like that. Is there any way that we measure how the cleanness of the air, or is there any sort of standard, any I didn't know, you know how we look at that. If I could grab Mr. Lynchy right now, which I can't because he's not yeah. with us, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. he'd rattle stuff off for you because I know that he, obviously that was a, an enormous element of his responsibility through through the pandemic, uh, and and we did man we did work that problem and that situation. Uh, we upgraded our filtration systems. Um, we found that some of those upgrades drove more maintenance issues because um, as one of these requests tonight, as a citizen suggests, um, moving through thicker, heavier, better filtration is more demanding of the mechanical systems that are moving the air. So we confronted that and found that. Uh, but he has uh, periodically throughout the throughout the experience we've just come through and does normally uh, test for particulates and the like. Um, uh, does the same thing with water. All of those are on his bailiwick, and so uh, I think we could drill down with him to, to talk more about, but he's, he's, he's satisfied right now that the work that we're doing is, is providing us a, a, you know, a healthy environment, so. Excellent. No, I'm glad we're always looking at that if, you know, if it was to ever go over a, a certain cusp, you know, where it become dangerous, then we would know, and. Well, and I think as we continue to, as we continue ongoing maintenance, which this community has been very supportive of in the facilities, I think we'll continue to look at the newest uh, con yep. contemporary solutions so that we can, as we cut the ceilings open, as we work with those systems, we upgrade them not only for current but future needs. Thank you. I mean, I'd rather see the playground at Little Harbor get upgraded, which is a concern, than, yeah. than uh, an $8 million investment for a couple of days a year. Um, and they can go outside and get the fresh air. So in terms of format, we'll go through the six that we deem, deemed eligible, and then we'll pause and see if anyone here wants to speak to those six, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. All right, what's next? Period? Okay, so the next category is the parks, playgrounds, and recreation category, um, and this one is Haven Park Lighting. So pedestrian crosswalk safety, installing a bath lighting along the length of the sidewalk, bisecting Haven, Livermore to Edward. Um, and the park has interior lighting and none along the sidewalks, very dark at night, making it unsafe to walk through. For pedestrians, um, Livermore Street exit of the park, vehicular traffic exiting Hancock Street, blinds pedestrians with their headlights. City staff recommends this for consideration as a potential future CIP project. Prior to formally creating a CIP project, a scope of work and public support should be determined for this project. Can I just pause there and ask Peter Rice to explain the timing of that, you know, the work it takes to get something on the CIP? Is that, is that in terms of coming up with costs associated right, with it? Right, right. Well, it, it really depends on the scope of the project. If it's simply putting a Cobra head light, which is a typical street, street light, it's a request into to Eversource and, and asking for an additional street light, which is not that challenging. 
I don't suspect that's what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. I think they're probably looking for uh, pedestrian lighting, which could be bollards, you know, uh, lit bollards along the path, which would look nice. However, that becomes trenching, um, and there's costs associated with that, and the light fixtures and things like that. Um, so it really needs to, in order for us to be able to give a reasonable number for planning, we need to understand what the scope is. And we recently upgraded the park, um, and you know, spent a lot of uh, resources on that, and it's in nice shape at the moment. Um, I guess, I, and this is one request, right. you know, it wasn't a groundswell of people saying, we need lighting here. Um, the park has been lit like this for years. Uh, I'd really, before make solid recommendations to move forward, I'd want to understand the scope, and I'd also want to understand the general public support for it. Um, there's a lot of parks that need attention, um, and you know, is this is this where we want to spend our resources? Okay. 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 Uh, just one comment on that. I would sure. hope, um, if we were to look at that, that the abutters were um, talked to, or at least because I, I would think anyone that lives around that park would be most impacted by any lighting. Um, I don't know how much benefit it would provide young children that would use it. I know I, I brought my niece over there, and it's. It's a playground for a younger age set, it seems. Um, no, I, I believe this is Haven Park, not the Haven oh, sorry, School, sorry, not sorry, the sorry, Haven yes, School yes, playground. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> All right, so our next category is um, art, historic documents, and artifacts. Um, and this is a request um, for funds to be put into a public art trust fund um, submitted on behalf of the city's public art review committee, or PARC as they're called, the new committee. Um, the request involves $25,000 to annually deposited through the CIP to be added to the public art trust fund um, to commission public art for the city's parks, neighborhoods, gateways, and public buildings. Um, the Economic and Community Development Department supports the standing committee on behalf of the public art review committee. This committee will be responsible for reviewing and making recommendations to the council on all issues related to public art, responsible for administering the 1% for art from, the large, from large city projects, and the request is to establish a baseline of funds that can be used for um, things like applying for federal grants and um, matching those federal grants and having sort of a basis of funds to do that with. Um, and, and then in working with the finance department, they determined the correct place for these funds would be in the public art trust fund. The request is for 25000 annually, which would be $150,000 over six years. Uh, there's more information on the Public Art Review Committee homepage about this committee as well. And I see the chair of the, the chair of that committee is here. And maybe when we get to the, the public comment, we'll speak to the last item, and then we'll open it up for comments on that. So the last item is historic record and artifact conservation and storage assessment. Um, I'll try not to read through all of this, but really this is a way to conserve um, some of the important public records held by multiple departments, finance, city clerk, library, legal, school department, police and fire, um, along with collections held by the Athenaeum, Strawberry Bank, and historic reports with the Historical Society. Um, the public-private facility will reduce redundancies and make more cost-effective long-term solutions. Um, to determine the facility needs for the studies, that um, includes architectural study of $40,000, security of $5,000, and HVAC of $25,000. And the scope should include a full understanding of the quantity of the items to be archived. And the idea would be this is to pr forever preserve these important artifacts. Um, I think that's the bulk of it. Um, the sec securing the collection will require hardened and robust construction. Um, card access will be required to get into it. Um, the mechanical and HVAC is very dependent on the items, but fire suppression would also be required. And um, the archive, Blue Ribbon Committee, is seeking 65000 for the initial conservation assessment in FY25, and then 75000 in year two for architectural studies. Um, from a staff standpoint, the city has been challenged with housing and maintaining these historical records and artifacts. Um, the historical archives facility would be beneficial to the city. Um, looking at looking at what's there, um, it would be a way to manage would manage those those uh, needs, and they have a wealth of documentation and historic artifacts that really need some kind of attention in this way. So it's something that we've been looking at for a while. Um, Considering the scope of the collection, staff estimated the cost of a full conservation assessment to be more than initially assessed with costs closer to 150000 for year one, and the year two assessment in out year should be reassessed for the cost at that time. 
So that wraps the six that um, were submitted that are deemed eligible for consideration by the CIP. Before we open it up to the public, any council questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, has the archive committee looked at the land and community heritage program, LCHIP, as a possible grant source? I would think a city as historic as Portsmouth, you know, might be a good contender for an LCHIP grant. Yeah, I think part of the part of the request included that the idea that the funds would be able to be used for match to grants like that. Um, but yeah, that's a good idea. I don't think I. We'll make sure the staff yeah, has I'll that, that in mind. So why don't we do this? If you'd like to speak to any of the six that 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 we've just talked about, please come up. Um, Grab a chair at the table and grab a mic and uh, give us your name and your address and, and share your thoughts with us if you would, if anybody would like to. Someone should have to step up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Chris Dwyer, 600 Broad Street, um, and chair of the park committee, um, both to be able to answer questions. Um, I think, uh, Councillor Tabor, that's an interesting idea. Uh, we were the first to ever have LCHIP uh, support a cemetery, um, so it's possible that we could break ground with public art. Uh, but yes, um, we wanted to build up some dollars that we could use for matching funds in, in a case like that. Um, as you all have probably seen since we did the African Burying Ground, there's really been an appetite for public art in the city. We have the one piece that's been commissioned for the Bohenko Gateway Park, but also see that these dollars would build up as match to private dollars for um, extending pu uh, some public art in that um, section of the community, as well as maintenance for some of the existing public art that we have. So we wanted to follow the model that's been used for land acquisition and that's been used for cemeteries over time, knowing that $25,000 is not probably, unless there's an unusual match, going to help us very much, but that over a multi-year period, we would, we would bank some dollars to be able to take advantage of things that came up. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming. All right. Uh, if anyone wants to speak on this group, great. And if not, we will move into the ones that already exist in the CIP, and we'll spend um, a brief moment of time on those. So these are projects that are um, existing in the CIP, and there's 24 projects listed here. Um, so let's start with an order, it looks like. Um, it's okay. So um, just, the first two. just the first two are reversed. So I'll start with the Woodland Sidewalk Improvements. Um, so this is F.W. Hartford and T.J. Gamester Avenue to repair dangerous sidewalks, um, numerous spots where there's equipment that's damaged the sidewalks and sharp metal out of some of the sidewalks. And city councilors have toured these sidewalks, it, it says. Um, although similar to other woodland sidewalks requests, the submission is maintained related, um, including metal shards sticking to the sidewalk. Staff um, has noticed that this submission was forwarded to the city's public works highway department to address. The sidewalk was found to be deficient in one area and repaid with a 40-foot section repaved. The remainder of the sidewalk work for this neighborhood has been added to the CIP future project list under the sidewalk construction program for FY24. So this is, again, an existing CIP project, CIP project that will continue to be addressed. And you know what, we'll lump that with the third one that you see up here because it's a similar um, project. Yeah. And if it's DPW related, do you want Peter to speak to it? Yeah, Peter, could you? I mean, the first, the way you just talked about is yeah. purely a maintenance issue. Is It was not a capital item. The other ones are addressed already by the sidewalk um, CIP element sheet, uh, and we will add it to that list. Great. Thanks. Question? Sure. Um, so we annually, or I think every two years, budget of 400000 for sidewalks. 800000 800? every two years, yeah. Boy. 400000 every year. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, do we grade those the way we grade the, st the street paving? In other words, do we say this sidewalk is the most urgent and the most deteriorated? And, and we, we, we have a uh, sidewalk condition report that we did a, a number of years ago, um, probably four years ago, five years ago. And we are this year going through and, and looking to establish a more annual type of review of the sidewalks. Uh, typically what happens, it's a combination of, of people bringing um, issues to our attention and a combination of projects, uh, synergy with other projects that we're doing, whether it's a, a road project or water project or something like that. Um, so a lot of times it's, it's safety driven if there's a, a rough section uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, but oftentimes it's, um, it's a matter of people bringing it to our attention and it makes sense because we're doing another project and we take care of it. Uh, but what we're initiating this year is uh, contracting with somebody to do um, a, a revisit of the report and set it up so that, like the roadway, we do a quarter of the city every year. So every four years, the entire city's done. Um, so we're looking to do that with the sidewalks as well. Great, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Okay, um, I'll go back to the, the second item on the list up there, um, public restrooms in Portsmouth. Um, been looking for public restrooms in downtown Portsmouth. Um, the, the Submitter requested that public bathrooms be installed in the downtown. We're traveling to other U.S. cities and European cities. Um, you can find those public bathrooms uh, rather than having to go to existing businesses, which may not be able to accommodate people. Um, and this, uh, this item is being incorporated into other public infrastructure upgrades, including the city's upcoming Market Square upgrades. So this is, a, again, an existing project. Next item I'll go into is sidewalks on Sagamore Avenue to replace broken sidewalks where asphalt is crumbling. Um, the safe and intact sections around where the Sagamore apartments are located and the rest towards the bridge is non-existent. A lot of walkers, especially with the increase of residences and businesses. Crosswalk would also help where Jones Avenue intersects Sagamore near the entrance of the cemetery. Not only for walkers, but also kids going to school at, at the high school in Little Harbor. Project has already been funded in prior prior year CIP FY24 project TSM19 PW68, and the project will move forward as soon as feasible. So I, I can speak to that. A, a lot of the um, a lot of the sidewalk is going to get done as part of the um, uh, the sewer extension project uh, that was done um, along Sagamore Ave, uh, and the road is still. Um, in, in disrepair or it's being, you know, it's temporarily paved. We're looking at doing the road work, final road work next spring and the sidewalk will be done as part of that as well. Okay, keep going. Um, the lighting on State Street, so walking back from Prescott Park on State Street in the evening, it does not have very good lighting. Um, this was the concern and they're hoping for a way to improve that lighting. That um, item is funded through the city's public works department and its annual operating budget the highway department will review the brightness of these lights as part of its ongoing initiative. I think that one speaks for itself unless people yeah. have questions. It's, it's a maintenance okay. item. Okay. Um, street paving, Boss and Lawrence. Um, this is um, the neighborhood of Boss and Lawrence. I've lived there for 16 years. The road and sidewalk condition was bad when we moved and is terrible now. Street paving is prioritized based on volumes of traffic, condition of pavement, and city's pavement management program. The request is existing in CIP projects um, TSM 94 PW 78, Street Paving Management and Rehabilitation. The plan documents the upcoming streets to be paved. Uh, the other aspect of this, uh, which wasn't noted, uh, was there's pending stormwater improvements uh, in that section. Um, there's easements that are required to be able to, to complete that stormwater work, uh, and that's, uh, that's an ongoing effort. So we're aware of the condition of this roadway, and it is being addressed. This next one is for sound barriers, I-95 from Woodbury Overpass to Market Street Underpass. Um, this is to create structural sound barriers along the stretch of I-95 to promote and maintain health in the noise polluted neighborhood close by. Um, according to studies, there's problems with noise including stress related illness, high blood pressure, sleep disruption, um, and also references to Clean Air Act and Noise Control Act and other, other federal acts about noise and and uh, disturbances. There's an existing CIP project 
FY24B107PWNH44, sound barriers in residential area along I-95 that addresses this issue. New Hampshire DOT has determined that the east side of I-95 is not eligible for state and federal funding. Staffs reach out to determine if a solely funded city project could be completed. Previously allocated funds can be used to study this request and determine the appropriate funding level for sound barrier project. There's a sound barrier project page on the city's website for more information. Peter, do you just want to add to that? Yeah, so the good news is that DOT is anticipating starting this construction work on the west side of, uh, of the highway uh, this April. Um, so they're in the process of that. We continue to work with them to try to figure out if there's a way we could uh, fund our own uh, sound wall along the east side. However, there's a, a federal highway uh, rules that, that um, seem to prohibit that uh, from an equity standpoint. Um, so that's something that we're continuing to work on, and um, you know, the the it is it is something we're very aware of, and we we don't disagree that it's something that'd be really nice to be able to take care of. I know that um, the federal government said we couldn't build them and pay for them ourselves on their land, mm -hmm. but we can if we own the land. Is that correct? That is correct. However, uh, so th we we had an independent um, sound engineer go out and look specifically at New Franklin School, mm -hmm. and the height of the walls in the area would be 40, 50 feet tall. Um, and the challenge is if you don't build them long enough, you don't uh, get, you know, you can have the sound come around them. Right. Um, so okay. uh, it is something that we're looking at. Um, you know, ideally we could build it closer to the road so we weren't dropped down the embankment. There are probably sections of the city that aren't as, as deep as that. Um, but. It is something that we're paying attention to, and, and the monies that identified uh, can go to further studying that. Uh, this isn't something that's falling off the radar screen. We we just finding a we way. We understand. <laughs> um. Okay, next one is the sidewalk reconstruction on Maple Haven. Uh, this is to remove old sidewalks and grass over, which is part of a larger existing project, CIP 24. The city sidewalk and construction program. So there's, there's a number of ones that are associated with uh, the Maple Haven neighborhood. Uh, as you may be aware, um, staff has had a number of meetings um, in that neighborhood, and we've uh, been working to try to come to some consensus uh, on how to move forward. We are planning on doing a um, road crossing at Ocean Road. Uh, to connect the two neighborhoods. Um, that's something that we've figured out how to move forward with that. Uh, so we're planning on doing that next uh, spring and summer. Um, you know, however, it's, you know, and, and we are still working to, to see if we can gain some consensus in terms of the type of project that will be acceptable. Um, so there's a number, the number of um, items here associated with that. Yeah. Well, it was an encouraging to see that this spark the creation of a neighborhood association yep. and the neighbors themselves started breaking the work into three parts and some of the, some parts are not that controversial you know something like Winchester which is a really narrow street narrow than all the others that's harder because it you know, the right away starts to go up onto people's lawns but there's other parts of the Maple Haven that big wide streets and plenty of room to to do sidewalks, so it's, it seems to be progressing. It, it is, and it's. I would say it's part of our ongoing program. So, in terms of creating, I mean, it's obviously it's the the council's decision. Um, but I feel like it's it is something we're addressing. It is something that we're working to budget uh, to as as we get clearer definition of what the projects are. I thought the process over Panaway went very well. I thought you know it was very. Clear steps. Um, you know, we took talked to all the residents. Um, you know, had Paul came up with a nice solution. Um, but are we following the same similar process over in Maple Haven? Uh, we did a uh, pretty much the exact same approach. Yeah. Um, there was not as uh, a consensus that was reached. Okay. Um, so we're going to be finishing up uh, Panaway likely next year. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, with the as resources are, are available. You know, we are going to continue to work with Maple Haven. Uh, they are on the, the list. It is an old request. Um, so we, you know, we understand that folks would like to address this, but it's just not clear how. Thank you. And the Panaway sidewalks came out great. Yeah, they do look good. I saw They're them really, yeah. That's a 
Okay, this is a, a different Maple Haven request. This is for a bicycle pedestrian non-motorized study. To, uh, this request is to update the bicycle pedestrian plan and bring the plan up to date with community needs along with the climate action plan, reprioritize infrastructure investments and move towards uh, future bicycle network. And then creating realistic goals for five years, um, working with, with Sabre and other subgroups of the Portsmouth Climate Action Plan. Um, so I can speak to this one. There's an update to the bicycle pedestrian plan in progress. The, the Public Works and Planning, Depart Planning and Sustainability Department have a, have a proposal. Um, the proposals basically going to be an update to the 2012 bicycle pedestrian plan. That work will be looking at what's been done since the 2012 plan, what needs to be done since that plan, prioritizing ongoing recommendations for 2014, um, and then some refinements and changes to the types of bike infrastructure that's built. Um, you know, there's modern, things have changed since 2012 on how they build bike infrastructure, so looking at that. Um, including a robust public public outreach process. Uh, it'll involve a steering committee and several public meetings to go over that. Um, that RFP should be out on the street in one to two weeks, so we'll be hearing back. The work should get started on that plan in the beginning of next year. And then I think the idea is to include some of the implementation goals that come from that plan in, in the conversation this time next year and beyond with the next capital improvement plan. Yeah, there's, a, there's a number of items that are addressed that'll address that and just to add that. to that I got an update the state should be finishing up the rail trail they should be almost in removing everything to Barbary now and they should be finishing the final coat next year they're, they're ahead of schedule I believe they are the ahead trail. of schedule yeah. is what I heard last right. night yeah yeah they said the fall of next year but it's got to be faster than that the way they're going uh, yeah. exactly yeah okay keep going uh, that one All right. You can talk about it. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, air, oh, we talked about the air conditioning in the high school, um, the Portsmouth High School. Right now, the language wing is one of the few areas in the high school with lacking air conditioning. Um, teachers rely on large fans. We talked about these a little bit, but this is in the, in the language wing. Um, air conditioning, even more detriment, detrimental to teachers who are expected to spend their entire day lacking air conditioning. Be beneficial if the school board help the language wing get AC. Um, I don't know. This will start to be programmed in FY30, which is the last year of this the plan we're talking about now. Correct. So they, yeah, they talked about this already as FY30. Yep. So I'll move on. Uh, the repaving of Coakley Road and Larry Lane. Repaving Coakley Road and Larry Lane is desperately needed, is the comment. Um, street paving is prioritized based on the volume of traffic, condition of pavement, and the city's pavement management program. Um, this request is existing in CIP 24 and the project number. Peter, do you want to speak to that at all? Uh, no, we, we, you know, we're, we're monitoring the area and, you know, depending upon uh, other types of projects, uh, it, it can, it, paving is not just the pavement condition, it, it's volume of traffic, it's um, safety, it's if we're doing, oftentimes if we're doing other projects, uh, we leverage those resources. Um, and the types of, of, of activities, whether it's a, a maintenance type of acti uh, pavement activity or whether it's a replacement of pavement, is dependent upon the condition. So, you know, we're aware of the request and it's, it's part of our, our pavement management plan that we annually, you know, generate a new plan every year and review. Um, and we will, it'll, it'll rise to that level when appropriate. Okay. Um, so Madison Street between Austin and State, Residents are parked in the front lawn on Madison Street. They're requesting curbing, tree planters, other roadway improvements. The project was added to CIP in 2019 to be completed in 25, but then was delayed to 29. Residents are requesting it be restored to its 25 timeline. The project already exists in the CIP plan. Um, funding for this project is currently shown in out years due to funding availability. So that's a matter of funds. Um, traffic calming on Woodbury Avenue. Install traffic calming measures along all along Woodbury Avenue from Market Street Extension to Bartlett Street intersection with specific attention to areas between 95 and Dennett. This is an ongoing CIP project called out with a specific number. Yeah, we, we just had a meeting last night on this topic and we'll be coming back to the Parking Traffic and Safety Committee on the 29th of this month. It's an evening meeting um, to have the final recommendation. Uh, there was a, a consensus that the 
speed pillows were effective. Uh, there was a desire to reduce the number, uh, total number from eight, um, and at this point we're looking at uh, six or, or five, five or six. So we'll be coming back with the final recommendation to Park and Traffic and Safety, which will then come to Council uh, once that meeting is done. Sidewalk on Buckminster Way. Um, sidewalk between two Buckminster Way entrances. Um, the Stonegate neighborhood includes 30 homes representing several families. And although they are aware Ocean, Ocean Road is a state road, they've observed several sidewalks installed over the years and residents walk along the stretch between Buckminster Way entrances where there's not, not only no sidewalk but no safe shoulder either. Several residents have voiced a need for this improvement. Um, over the years, even requesting it to the City Mayor and City Council years ago. Look forward to your consideration. Um, this request will be reviewed in conjunction with the update to the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan. As we discussed, um, it could be considered in addition to the project list. Bike Fed Master Plan is currently community needs. Oh, we just talked about the Bike Fed Master Plan and how that'll be looked at. So um, that should be looked at through the Bike Fed Master Plan process. I'll go on to the next one, the splash pad at the outdoor pool. A request for a splash pad at the outdoor pool in Pierce Island. In the recent updated recreational needs study, the support for building a splash pad somewhere in the city. Um, staff have been looking options for those locations. One of the important aspects in citing a splash pad is equity and accessibility. The outdoor pool location is not one that is recommended due to the lack of bus service or bike lane access to the island in creating the Greenland Road rec facility. The thought was to add a splash pad to an upcoming phase, which is currently in FY30, but also continuing to analyze other locations that might be better, better for accessibility. Have you looked at community campus, possibly? Uh, we haven't at sure. this point. Just curious whether or not there would be a convenient location to put one out there. Uh, there, there could be. I mean, we could look at that. Kate Street. Kate Street Bridge. Um, reconstruct the Kate Street Bridge over Hodgson Brook, it's NHDOT red listed bridge, red listed bridge only rated for 6,000 pounds. Fire equipment cannot cross and therefore endangered life in a property on cottage area. It's been in the CIP for like 15 years. Uh, the project is already found in the CIP citywide bridge improvement, improvements, FY 24 and 25. Yeah, the, we're also uh, waiting on state, getting into the state bridge funding program. Um, so that's in part one of the reasons uh, we're holding off. Uh, Elwyn Road side path. It was in the CIP for seven to ten years, then disappeared. There's a request for a construction date. Uh, the response is the project has been funded and is in the queue for construction. See the city's project page for most up-to-date information. It was uh, removed from the CIP once it was fully funded. Projects are removed for two distinct reasons. They're fully funded and they're no longer possible given the current condition within the CIP timeline are no, no longer desired. The funding page is found with this link here under Public Works Projects. I think this is a good time to plug the Public Works page because there's a host of projects that we have ongoing now. And if you're looking for updates on any particular project or projects, you can sign up and give your email address and we will include you in the regular updates that we push out to, to residents. It's also in the state plan too. So replacement of Maplewood Avenue Bridge, Maplewood Avenue Culvert Bridge, um, another re DOT Red Lester Bridge. <coughs> this project has already been funded. It's in the CIP's project page again on the same in the same location. Um, it, it's oh. it's going to be fun. It's going to be bid this year. Yeah, I mean we work we just got permits. Um, yeah, the Concom um, has reviewed the wetland permit. Yeah, wetland permit. So it's it's going to be bid this year. Beverly Hill Road improvements. Um, reconstruct Beverly Hill Road. It's been the CIP for 15 years and disappeared. This project is moving forward. Check the city's website for most up-to-date. Again, another project that's taken some time, but it is in process. Um, you can you can see the update on the city's projects page. Do you want to give a further update, Peter? Any more? Um, uh, the DOT's approved the final design. We're moving forward. We should be doing um, uh, uh, land ac um, land right away acquisitions um, in the near future. Um, it's, a, it's the project's moving forward. I'd encourage folks to look at the um, the city's website uh, for the latest updates. Bartlett Street Railroad trestle improvements. Um, this is to widen a request to widen and raise the railroad underpass. 
also been in the CIP for a long time. Um, the city recently secured grant funding to study the reconfiguration of the railroad bridge and intersection, which will determine the feasibility and cost of these changes. So just to, to speak to this one, if I may. Sure. Um, there seems to be some confusion relative to ownership of that rail bridge. Um, it, it is a railroad bridge. It's not a city-owned bridge. Um, however, uh, we have worked uh, with developers to get some money secured, and we did a, um, a grant application for uh, a consolidated rail infrastructure and safety improvements grant, and we were successful in, in getting that grant. Uh, that's a grant that we will do in collaboration uh, with the railroad uh, to try to revisit um, the replacement of that bridge, which will address these concerns. Um, it is something that uh, was identified historically in the um, in the CIP. There was a period of time when projects that were not city projects were listed in there, and it was deemed confusing confusing to the general public. So we no longer do that. Uh, that includes DOT projects and other uh, federal and state projects, and that's why they are not shown in the in the uh, in the CIP. Uh, the next one is the Seacoast Drinking Water Liability Project between Fox Point and Wagon Hill, uh, Newington to Durham. Uh, this comment is that new water in 20-inch diameter main under Little Bay project bids open in September with a low bid of 27 million. When the city didn't budget enough money, um, they need a new allocation to cover the 20, 20, 22 million deficit, is the comment. Um, so I can speak to that. Um, so this project came in way over budget. Um, obviously, the city is not going to you know, spend that kind of money. Um, this is not an emergency situation. This is a maintenance planning exercise. And what we're doing is we're going to break the project into parts. And the first part, we'll be doing some on-land uh, repairs to valves so we can isolate the two um, lines more effectively. Um, we're also looking at alternatives um, to the, uh, the, uh, the crossing. Um, in addition, uh, we're looking running down Route 4, potentially. Uh, but we're also working with the, um, the regulators to adjust to allow a longer schedule, because the, the real reason for the, the high price was that um, the schedule couldn't be met. It was a, a open, they allowed a certain amount of time that you could work in the water, and the contractors said, no, we can't do that, so they put a really large number on it, knowing that they would likely be in violation if they started and didn't do it. Um, so it was an exercise, you know, that they, they were interested, they didn't want to say no, uh, but they gave us clear uh, feedback saying, if the schedule could be adjusted, we could get this price down significantly. So we are working to that end. Um, but we will start and break it up into two phases, and we'll likely have something out on the street for the first phase uh, by the, you know, probably by March or February this year, next year. And are those limitations by like the Department of Environmental Science, or, or who who's setting those? Uh, it's it's DES, it's Fish and Game, it's, um, it's the state. It's, it's you know it's it's a combination of those folks. And I'm not sure which one exactly. I think it's Fish and Game that's the one that's holding it up the most. And National Marine Fisheries Service is all involved in those decisions. The yeah. feds get involved in those permits, too. Yep. And question, we have two lines under there now that are Correct. old and pitted and yep. showing where. And, but we'll, we'll fix the valve so that we can go from one to the other if we need to. Right, so um, if, if one, one of the lines breaks, we can isolate it. Right now, the valves, because they're 50 plus years old, um, right. They're not working well. And and if we shut them, we're worried that we'll never open it again. Yeah. So we're going to get those the valves functional, and that way we can isolate it if necessary. And one of the misconceptions on this project was that we were going to eliminate two, two lines and put in one line. The project was going to be a third line, so additional redundancy. So we'd still we'd have the 20-inch the new one yeah, two. and the two old ones Correct. with valves that yep. work. Um, but, the next, the, but, but this is not, you know, here. this isn't like dire, it's going to fall up, it's going to break today. Um, you know, so this is a maintenance thing. Right. Do we want to get it done soon? Yes. But it's, it's not like we have to do it immediately today. So the, the next two requests for uh, involve sidewalks in Maple Haven, which we talked about in their existing CIP projects. So um, we talked about the bigger CIP picture. Move in. Uh, Route 1 sidewalks uh, for pedestrian and bicycle commuting, Route 1 north and south directions, 
Um, portions of this request are in design. There's an existing CIP project that plans for complete streets. Peter, you want to touch on that at all? Uh, the, uh, the DOT just recently restarted this effort. Uh, they're looking to have a public meeting uh, at the, towards January of this year, um, but they've, they've kind of reinvigorated the effort. Uh, they do not anticipate the work being done until uh, probably three or four years out. That concludes the, the breakdown of how the 24 projects that were requested by citizens um, have come to find a place in the CIP. So, Councillor Tabor? Uh, just before we leave these, um, Sarah Jarvis has had conversations with me over four years about is there any way that there can be a bike connection from Maple Haven to the rail trail? Um, yes. Either via heritage. <laughs> and yeah. Peter, you, yeah. you want to speak to it? Well, I, I, we've already investigated it, <clears throat> initially investigated at least, a trail. We're not sure that there's public access the entire way in terms, of, in terms of ownership, but there's actually a trail right now that people use that gets from Maple Haven to the rail trail and comes out on Mary, from Marriette with Marriette. If you continue into the woods at Marriette, yeah. you'll, hit, you'll hit a trail that takes you all the way to the new rail trail. So we explored that um, recently and haven't really figured out how to, how to get all ownership of the whole way or right away the whole way, but it looks like it's really feasible. It's That's not great. going through a lot of wetlands or anything like that. That's so. great. It's, it's a challenging mountain bike ride right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> quite a trail yet, but it's, yeah. but it's possible. Well, yeah. there's probably some 13-year-olds in Maple Haven who are going to try that. They do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's a good neighborhood. It's a young neighborhood with a lot of kids. And oh, I, I agree. And, and actually, both sides, the south side and the north side, we believe there's quarters that we can get over to the rail trail. Yeah. So it, it's something that Peter and I have been talking about this. This is really exciting to be able to do. Yeah, great. It's going to make a lot of connectivity throughout the city. Yep. And I just have one other question. Um, some of the projects that were saved, better served by another process, were those the people that submitted those? Were they contacted to tell what to do? Were they? I just want to make sure that we, um, yep. you know, we're nice and tell them and kind of direct them where to go. And right. Yeah, thank you. Sure. That's an important point. Yeah. We did respond to everybody who put something in here. So why don't we uh, open up to public comment on the on the on the 24 that we just walked through? If anyone has anything they'd like to add, I should ask if anyone's on Zoom, Kevin. But I don't believe anyone is. Okay, we can uh, we'll roll through the list of ones that would be suited by a, um, another process or are not appropriate for CIP. Okay, so the first one here is traffic coming on Pleasant Street. Uh, traffic calming, speed table installation needs to be implemented in the section of Pleasant Street from Hancock to Marcy. Multiple residents have made the request to slow traffic uh, in a very narrow stretch of Pleasant Street. Um, talks about you know different times of day and types of types of traffic that cause problems in that area. Um, this project is a potential to be CIP eligible under the current CIP traffic calming. FY24 CIP project, but should begin with a review from the Parking, Traffic, and Safety Committee. Stack, staff recommends interested parties contact Parking, Traffic, and Safety with this request. So this is a, a request that we're going to see um, a couple of these uh, reference to Parking, Traffic, and Safety to get the ball rolling on a project of this nature. I don't know if you want to say any more, Peter. Or should so, I so traffic calming is a, a process that's in this. Uh, it's in our website or on our website that kind of walks the uh, residents through. It's a. F it starts with a request. Uh, it, it has an evaluation stage, but we also through the process we need to have uh, that there's this support for a change in a, in, a, in a neighborhood. Oftentimes, one or two people come forward with something, and we've learned um, that if we jump on that um, and start moving forward, there's oftentimes other folks that don't want to do that type of uh, thing. Um, so the, the traffic calming process is intended to kind of flesh that out. It, it puts the onus on the person that's requesting the traffic calming measure to do some legwork and to show that there's consensus and there's some interest in the neighborhood so that we know as we move forward spending staff time and, and resources um, that it's, it's not just one person uh, that has a specific uh, concern. Um, so the, the process is, is online. Uh, people can go to that and, um, and, and click on it. And it's a, if they have questions, they can contact Eric Eby, our transportation engineer, at 603-427-1530. Um, and they can, they, he can oh, help them out. <laughs> 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 <So. clears throat> 
little public service announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Eric says thank you. Yeah, Operators are standing for Eric. Um, well, we have a lot of requests that look like that same sort of uh, direction. Um, like the next one, uh, pedestrian crossing and signage, also a reference to parking traffic and safety for uh, Marcy, South Mill, and South Street. So that is better served by making that request as Peter just described. Um, <clears throat> Little Harbor School is the next request. Um, this is at the playground at Little Harbor School to, to update the structures um, and to deal with some exposed concrete and rusting metal, a long overdue project. Um, the school department validates the need for these upgrades, and um, I think I'll let them speak to it a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, I would simply say I, that uh, the facilities director has been, uh, they've met three or four times already with uh, members of the PTA, and they're moving forward. Um, that will be funded through the, the, the wonderful support that the PTA continues to show and the operating funds that we can make available through the department. Yeah, and I can add that I've, I've gotten calls from them as, all, as well just to talk about the wetland permit side of things. Right. Yep. Yep. I think that was one of the clarifications was this, this isn't as easy as we just want to do this. It's a sensitive spot, so we have to be right. careful. Right. Um, sidewalks on Jones Avenue. The request is quite simple. Sidewalks on Jones Avenue. Sidewalk mm -hmm. expansion requires a consensus from the entire neighborhood as well as documentation from the neighborhood staff recommends. Wait for it. The Park and Traffic and Safety Committee. Um, this is another request that is, is better served by sending it to the Park and Traffic and Safety Committee to get consensus of the neighborhood. So Maple Haver neighborhood. Um, this is a CIP request uh, regarding improvements, optimization, and existing sidewalk. So we have another Maple Haven neighborhood request um, in the project served by another board. Uh, the feasibility study is needed in order to evaluate if it's possible to protect to proceed with this project. Staff is recommending the submitter of this project send it to the Parking, Traffic, and Safety Committee. Um, I'll keep going. Yep. Um, extending Elwyn Park side path, the Elwyn side, Elwyn side path to the Rye Line or Tucker's Cove neighborhood, currently Oakwood and Re Regina Street neighborhoods, isolated from surrounding neighborhoods and walking paths by Elwyn Drive. This, this request will be reviewed in conjunction with the update to the bicycle pedestrian plan. As we talked about, that bicycle pedestrian plan is going to look at pending projects. Um, it may be eligible for a future CIP project, um, but that updated pedestrian plan will address that. This is a request for portable bike racks throughout the city. Um, please consider purchasing portable bike racks. Um, this, again, another project that will be reviewed by the bicycle and pedestrian plan. Um, some good ideas in there in terms of portable bike racks for concerts and that type of thing, and I think there'll be a, a in-depth public process where these re recommendations can be made and evaluated by that process. Peter, is there anything else you want to say there? Nope. Okay. Um, bicycle access to Maple Haven. Uh, I think we talked about that that with the trail to, to the new rail trail, and that will be reviewed in conjunction with the bike ped plan. But we're already started looking at that. Um, Maplewood Downtown Complete Streets, Maplewood Avenue. Please return the Downtown Maplewood Complete Streets project that was removed from the CIP last year. Overly wide and dangerous street created during urban renewal. Prime candidate for narrow or reduced driving lanes. Um, again, this is a, a prime project for the bike ped plan and updating that 2012 plan to identify um, where this fits into that process. Middle Street Downtown Bicycle Pedestrian Connectivity, um, reinstating Middle Street Downtown project. Again, this is a bike ped project um, that will be looked at through the updated Bicycle Pedestrian Plan. Um, similar to the Gosling Road, multi-use path on Gosling Road is recommended in the Bicycle Pedestrian Plan to remove the travel lane or median for two-way traffic on Gosling. Um, another good, good request for the Bicycle Pedestrian Plan, which again, is gonna start beginning, beginning of the year, next year. Um, Woodbury Avenue multi-use path, create a multi-use path of bike lanes on Woodbury Ave between Market and Gosling. Again, a bicycle pedestrian plan uh, request that's suitable for that. Wilson to Ocean Road bicycle pedestrian work. Uh, project was described in a past CIP project, but the scope of the DOT project is now from Wilson to Ocean. 
Um, this is another project that's going to be looked at in the bicycle pedestrian plan. Jump in if you have any additional things, Peter, but I move forward. Maybe um, Peter can talk to the next two, the traffic circle and the seawall. Yep. yep. So the Portsmouth traffic circle modernization modernized the 1950s era single lane Portsmouth rotary to modern high capacity two lane roundabout like the one at Lee um, and in Keene. That is a potential air pollution reduction possibility if that's done that way. Um, it's a state DOT project with New Hampshire DOT. The project is the highest priority project being requested and added to the state's 10 year plan, which I believe is under design or look, look for a design study. There was money set aside in which to be able to do, right, to do a design study. Um, tr they've encouraged the state to move it up in the 10 year plan if possible, but we haven't gotten an answer on that yet. But it is in the 10 year plan. Right, it's not city property. No. Um, this next one's labeled seawall, but it, it goes a little beyond seawall. It looks at identifying, it looks at a seawall component um, in the south end uh, and looks at the end of uh, different streets that go up to the water, impacts from increasing climate change and storm surges, protecting in water and sewer, and identifying public access points to the water. Um, the area around the end of pa pa Partridge Street and the right away to the water there is one component of that. Um, it doesn't really qualify as a capital project. Uh, the city will evaluate if coordination with the private project is feasible for city eligible portions. Do you want to speak to that, Peter? A little more? No, it, it seemed like she wanted to piggyback off of um, a private project. Um, and it just wasn't, just given the permitting and all the things associated with it, it just wasn't um, appropriate from our standpoint. Um, the next, the next the item two. would be the, the last two. Uh, Sherburn School for Senior Housing. Renovation of the school to become a senior housing facility helps affordable housing issue while providing downsized choice for elderly people looking to sell their houses and live in a smaller place. Priority given to Portsmouth residents. Adding a second floor and structurally sound building also makes sense. The ball fields could remain and enhance the youthful activities surrounding the facility. Corner lot available for compatible use. Um, this decision is a policy decision that was made by the City Council. Project's mission does not qualify as a CIP project. Um, and this last one is a land acquisition funding change request that the CIP policymakers should set aside 2%. 0.7 million in FY24, the budget annually for the purpose of land conservation and open space protection. Um, this, the staff analysis is, although there is an existing CIP item for land acquisition for conservation purposes, the creation of a funding level policy percentage for a capital project is a policy decision of the council within itself, not a capital request. Am I correct in that we do set aside a certain amount of money every year, though, into a fund for that? So there's, I yeah, the last year's the CIP and this year's CIP, and then there's also the conservation fund, which sets aside money from current use penalty. So when project is turned out, taken out of current use, there's a 10% penalty assessed yep. that goes into the that conservation into fund. It. I can't imagine we have a lot of current use still in the city. I have a lot left. <laughs> that was the that was the basis for that request starting last year to put money into that fund. Is that why it's deep? So uh, what current uses? Is that what you're asking? The current penalty. So right, there is a pen there is a penalty, yes. It's under state law. So basically they you have to have more than the certain the state sets up and you have to have more than a certain amount of acreage and you get to lower your taxes if you're doing agricultural or it's farmland or it's some sort of recreation purpose or conservation, that sort of thing. So that's what allows you to do that. But if you take it out of that, right. then you pay the penalty for, for doing so. Um, Sorry, I know that from my work. Well, I didn't think that. <laughs> I didn't think I deal with that. I didn't think the state would let us impose a fee on our own. No, 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 no. It is state, state allowed. <laughs> would there be any questions from the folks here or on Zoom relative to what we just walked through um, with those in the category of better served by another process? Happy to hear your comment. Come on up. 
Grab a microphone if you would and state your name and address. Sure. Thanks. So our big viewing public can hear you. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, I was one of those people for a long time. Um, I'm Kate Hatem, 1 Ash Street in Portsmouth. I'm one of the uh, PTA parents that's a co-chair of the Playground Committee for Little Harbor. Um, as we stated in our request form, the playground is old, unsafe, dated to say the least. In May, my son broke his arm on a dilapidated zip line on the playground, which he's still um, many, many months later wearing a brace and doing occupational therapy for his injuries. Hasn't been able to play soccer, do all the activities that he loves, and he's not the only one that's been injured on that playground. <clears throat> We can't afford not to address the safety issues at the Little Har Harbor Playground right now. It's a major accident waiting to happen. It happened to me, it's gonna happen to somebody else. It has happened to many other children that I'm aware of over the years. Um, it was built almost 30 years ago. Safety standards have significantly changed in the past three decades. I don't want any more children to get injured there. I don't want them to have to go through what I went through or what my son went through. Um, so I really do hope that the city takes notice that the PTA can't do this alone. We need the city, we need the school board, we need to kind of work together to figure out how to get this project done. Um, to meet with Ken, there are some things that the city has, granite slab, sand, that we hope to utilize that he said that we can have. It's awesome, it's, it makes that process so much easier. Um, but we also need money. <laughs> so that's why I'm here tonight, to hopefully kind of just send our message. Um, it was my understanding that when Dondero redid their playground five or so, however many years ago, um, the city did provide some funds, the school department provided funds, and the PTA provided funds. Um, so I'm hoping that Little Harbor, can, we can work something like that up to. The PTA certainly will be fundraising Zach and I have talked on the phone several times about how can we finagle some money from the school department budget as well. But I also think um, we need to figure out how as a city we want to support this project too. It's, um, I, so when, when this happened to my son, I started to make calls and figure out, okay, how do we rectify the situation? How do we make something happen here? And um, you can correct me if I'm wrong too, but I believe DPW, manages all the city playgrounds except for the school playgrounds. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and to me as a parent, I was flabbergasted <laughs> to say the least. The, the playgrounds that are most utilized every single school day by hundreds of children aren't really managed. It's, it comes to a parent who has something happen to them that realizes they're just looking around and says, oh my God, well, how, how has nothing been done for 30 years to this playground besides you know the, the bare bones you know wood chips and stuff like that um, so I guess I was hoping to get a little bit more insight on the process for how can we come up with the, so there's a, a few different tiers here how do we come up with a bigger parks department or something that's managing all of the green spaces in the city but also how do we access funding now for a playground that is well overdue for a renovation. Um, Peter and I have also spoken on the phone, and I know you spoke with Ashley, who's also the co-chair of the Playground Committee. Um, we don't wanna just replace equipment. We, want, we know it's in the wetlands buffer zone right there where the, where the structure currently sits. We wanna improve the whole area. We wanna address the drainage. We wanna make it a safe place to play, but we also wanna be good stewards of the environment. Um, so. It's not just merely replacing equipment. We want to do it right, and we want to do it for the safety of our children, but also for the, the betterment of our environment. So I'm not sure what I expect to hear from you guys. I was disappointed that it didn't make it onto the plan, so I guess I'm wondering, how do we get it to make it on the plan, or how do we access other funds that already exist, whether it's in the DPW budget or the Rex department budget or somewhere, to help, even in small ways, to move this project forward. Zach, Nathan, do you want to take a step? <laughs> well, what you say? So I, 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 
first, let me apologize because your story is new to me. Mm. Um, and it's not new to us, clearly, because there's members of the team who know. Um, I don't think there's any question that there can be work done and that there's funding that we can direct. I will tell you that um, in the conversations that I've had, and I don't want to create yet another conversation, <laughs> but in the discussions that I've had, the Dondero initiative was a community playground initiative because it stood alone in that area of the city, that part of the city. Yeah. And so the support that was, uh, the support that came out, from outside of the school department, yeah. uh, from the city, came because uh, there wasn't another playground a five minute walk down the street, right? Sure. So yeah. I, I, I don't think that we expected at this point that the city would be uh, conditioned necessarily to find additional funding, but um, but I know that we had great success uh, with the work that we did at Dondero. Yeah. Um, and I know that other than the, the fear, if you will, of the impact that we might have and, and how we have to tread lightly, um, I've, ser I've seen the playground and I certainly believe that it needs, it needs significant work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that together we can do that. And so in the conversations that I've had with Mr. Lynchy, my sense was that we were moving in that direction. Uh, I probably should be involved in the conversation more because he's... I wrote your name down. He's probably... <laughs> Ken, Ken, Ken is probably uh, appropriately careful not to promise more than he thinks he can promise. Sure. And, um, and I should be... But you'll write me a check for $200,000. I, I should be appropriately careful as well, but I, I mean, I think... Um, uh, I don't think I'm talking about a $200,000 project. If I were, we'd be talking about, we'd, we'd have to come back and talk about a, a, you know, a different approach. But I certainly think that, that uh, we have the wherewithal to do what needs to be done for the playground. All right. And I'll get your number before we leave. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> I'd just like to add, I think that, I'm sorry what happened, but I think we should also look at some of our area community groups that we have that really try to help in these areas. Because I bet, I mean, as a member of the Elks, I'm sure if we approach them and talk to them to see whether or not there's any national grants we could go after, mm -hmm. there's a possibility we could do that as well. And that might help go towards right. getting the funding to do it sooner rather than waiting for it to be in a long-term plan. I think right. we need to do something more immediately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I'm willing to help you look into that if you need it. You know how to reach me. All right, perfect. <laughs> right. Making friends tonight, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I just, I'll just add to the Council Moreau, um, going through that process, I think we'd better changing the process would only delay things, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but I'd want to you know, move forward and find a solution as soon as possible. Okay. So. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, the producer uh, tells me that Matt Glenn is on Zoom and has his hand raised. So, Matt, please go ahead, if you would, with your question or your comment. Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks for making it accessible over Zoom. Uh, so, uh, Matt Glenn, I live at 34 Harrison Ave. Um, uh, it's really great to hear that. Um, oh, and, and I'm also uh, uh, currently serving as president of Seacoast Area Bicycle Riders. So. We are very appreciative uh, to hear that there's a, an update coming to the bicycle and pedestrian plan. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it's great to hear there's going to be a lot uh, more opportunity for community input and hopefully realistic goals um, for the next five years uh, because uh, we've got a great plan already, but uh, it, it does seem like there are missed opportunities and there are um, you know, roads that get repaved without improvements. And um, so we're really uh, excited about that, um, you know, an effort toward building out a real network. And um, I'll, I'll just keep stressing that word network every time I get a chance. Um, the one thing I wanted to suggest, uh, I think the CIP has had for a while uh, $50,000 a year for bicycle and pedestrian planning. And um, I'm wondering if, if you're not adding any additional projects this go around, since you're waiting on a, a bigger process to, to kind of choose, would you consider increasing uh, that amount um, just to have, have that money in the budget? And I do know there's a lot of federal money for multimodal projects that could be applied for, so um, it could be a benefit to that. Uh, thank you, and we're looking forward to being engaged. Thanks, Matt, appreciate it. Um, I understand there's no one else on Zoom, um, let alone with their hand raised, so. Um, if, if I can indulge the council, I'd like to flip-flop the order of the agenda to, talk, to go to public comment, because I know there's several folks here that haven't spoken on anything we've spoken about, so I'd like to open it up now to folks who might want to tell us why they're here and what they're interested in, so join us up here and 
Give us your name and address, if you would. Sure. Uh, my name is Greg Aber. I'm at uh, 183 Hillside Drive, and um, uh, I want to uh, bring up a topic um, that we've we've been in the Traffic and Safety Committee with as well. And uh, because of the timeline of how things have happened, I uh, wanted to get in front not just in front of City Council members, but some other folks involved in town who may or may not be aware of it. So, I brought a visual aid to help with the beginning of it, and then I'll kind of I can put it back up later. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Hillside Drive is here. Route one bypass, you know, landmarks to help out, like Toyota is here and high school, you know, just to give me a kind of idea, uh, idea of where we are here. And I'll come back to these drawings in a minute. So um, this uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, you've been around, you know, houses in the 1940s and um, for about, well, what we know is 50 years, uh, people have been using a cut through uh, to get to town. Um, and that's you know, it's interesting listening to all the other issues that are happening in town. Uh, just how much of this happens? Um, shared spaces that nobody's really sure uh, you know, about the bike path and things like that, how, how things come together and become habits. Um, and so what happened, and I'll read the, the letter that we put out to our neighbors. Um, and it said, Dear City Council, because that was our intended audience at the end, uh, the Hillside Drive residents request that in advance of the Greenleaf and Lafayette intersection traffic calming steps, um, you can tell we've talked to Peter before already here, a sidewalk be installed on the west side of Greenleaf from Hillside Drive, connecting to the intersection of Lafayette and South Street as part of Portland City's improvement plan in the spring of 2024. The ABC building cut through that has provided our neighborhood safe access to downtown, as well as our children's path to school, the library, and to Lafayette playground was fenced off over Labor Day weekend. The ABC building cut through has been used, we wrote in our letter here, over 30 years. And as we went around and my wife canvassed the neighborhood to ask people to get people's input, we found out it was closer to 50 years um, that that cut through has been used. Um, and it has, without that, um, has forced our whole neighborhood to cross Greenleaf where speed monitors have revealed that the average speed is nearly 50% over the posted limit. We must then cross the intersection of Lafayette and Greenleaf, an intersection the city has already identified as problematic for pedestrian and vehicle traffic. Because of this unexpected change, we believe the fence creates an urgent and significant need for pedestrian sidewalks. So we ask that the city prioritize a sidewalk to address pedestrian safety, improve walkability, and be a first step in traffic calming. We are hoping to remedy the situation as soon as possible to ensure the safety of the community. The Hillside Drive community very much appreciates all your quick actions so far, and this was the Traffic and Safety Committee helped us out with some early mitigation steps, and look forward to your response to our request. And so we talk with our neighbors. There's 36 residences on Hillside Drive. 33 residences voted in favor of getting sidewalks uh, at this area of Green Lake along there. So it's 92% of residents responded to this and said, yes, we agree with this. We would like to move forward as soon as we can. And we think that that's a result not just of a, uh, oh, geez, it's less convenient. But when we talk to people, we realize that of the 36 residences, all the adults, of course, who own and live in the homes, so there's 29 children, we were making 400 passes a week through that cut through, whether it was school, playground, doctors and dentist office that are in the ABC buildings, just walking to town. Part of what makes Portsmouth so great is you can walk to places. I mean, that's part of what draws people here. Um, and so again, 92% of us agreed with that. And after looking at kind of then we go back and you kind of look and see well, what does it look like here and I'm, I apologize people behind me here but these folks know what it looks like just the <laughs> <laughs> so this is there's a, a spur here so these are houses and there's a little spur to Hillside Drive with two residences here and this was the cut through and so uh, Thursday or yeah Friday afternoon I have a middle school or I have a elementary middle and high school but middle school are cut through here to walk to school um, Tuesday morning there was a fence there with a sign up that says no trespassing, you'll be prosecuted. And so um, from that moment, it's, uh, you know, and as we started off, you know, some kids say, well, okay, I can get around that fence, and then the fence is being extended. So it's, it's not a message, and the city has done some efforts to try and talk with the landowners, and they're not interested in talking. And like every neighbor, we kind of wish there had been discussions before something like that happens. But I don't know too many people are going to say that a middle schooler will just go through and we'll hope for the best. That's not how we're going to say when there's a sign that says we'll prosecute you. So that has forced us down into here. And um, it, 
this is just a place where people are leaving to get home, getting looking to get out of the city. And um, you know, if you're counting those of us who, when we come back from the from downtown, take a right here and are going about 10, 11 miles an hour, the average speed has been 30. So people are coming down a 20 mile an hour road, um, and I'm guessing here, but they're going an excess of 40 miles an hour. And when the um, the traffic bollards, is that the right word? The posts, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. When those are in place. So people don't have to slow down; they swing out into the other lane. Mm -hmm. So they're coming across, and it's <laughs> it's frightening, right? Like to pull up there in a vehicle, but then to cross on foot is even worse. And so this is also the planned path to get to the high school as well. But so I'm, I have three children, so I'm very focused on that. But it, it's also about old people too. People who are walking their dogs, bicycles. We have grandparents that come and watch children in the neighborhood. That stroller access, all of those things have now changed over here. And so we're we're going to get some flashers in here to try and slow people down at a crosswalk. But we, that doesn't get us across Greenleaf. And so what we're asking for is a sidewalk here. The sidewalk, I'm sorry. So uh, with the cut through would be here in this parking lot. This is a mix of professional and residents. And then the sidewalk starts here just after the entrance into the ABC buildings. And then you have South Street, which is an excellent regulated intersection that stops traffic in all directions. And we have, everybody can cross there. There's no issue. So we're asking for a sidewalk to get us up to there. Um, and we'd love to have one you know, tomorrow, but we know that's not how it works. And so we're asking for you to, to have this, and Karen, I'm going to borrow your words, is to rise to the top uh, of all these. And that because this happened, you know, literally uh, less than a week before the submission date, and I know that's what we're looking for, we're asking for a committee member to, um, to help push this forward so we can uh, have this happen uh, in the spring of 2004 uh, so we have safe passage for kids to school, grandparents with strollers, regular people walking to businesses, all of us walking to town, whether it's 4th of July or anything else, that's how we go. Right. And it's been closed off. So um, if you have, and I, I, won't, I don't want to speak for everybody behind me, but I know that I appreciate my neighbors coming, as most of us I think who are left here are, are my neighbors. And um, uh, it's been, um, it's been reaffirming to say, hey, can everybody get together for a meeting? And then you have 30 people show up mm -hmm. at 8 o'clock on a weekday night when everybody's got dinner and everything because it's that important to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had uh, I, Andrew Bagley and uh, the mayor came to one of our meetings too, which was great. I mean, just to have them come down and say, hey, what's happening? And to hear it. And Andrew's been helpful because he's on the Traffic and Safety Committee. And Peter's had great ideas for us as well. We just want to get it on everybody's minds. And it was very helpful to see how this process works. And we know we're asking for something that is uh, a part of the process, but not the mainline way that things go, but to get us right up to the top of this so that we can make sure we have safe passage as soon as possible. Understood. Thank you. Peter, do you want to touch on this at all or add I, color? You know, it's, I think it's a very reasonable request. I, I, underst I understand. It really it, it comes down to, you know, the, we have to prioritize, and ultimately the city council um, has to make decisions related to this. We have a submission process which, as I said to you, you know, you'd missed it, so I, I couldn't flex on that because we told other people, you know, that mm. you'd have to wait till next year. But there are, you know, appealing to the, the, the council is the appropriate way of going. Um, <laughs> you know, to, to that end, um, you know, I have, you know, anticipating this, I've asked staff to take a look at it. Uh, we have the arborist going out. There are a number of mature trees along that edge of the roadway that would, would be probably taken down um, as a result of this. Um, some of them, I think, are in rough shape, so it might be appropriate to, for them to be, you know, taken down. Um, but I think it's something that, you know, we, you know, we understand the, the challenge you guys are under. It is, I have had friends that lived on that na uh, in that neighborhood, and I used that cut through for a very, very, very long time myself. So I understand the difficulty when all of a sudden there's a block there. I'd like to add that this time last year, we had a group of residents come in and request that uh, a seemingly, um, um, limited project on Edmond Avenue be changed and modified to include sidewalks. Correct. And it was in this setting that the conversation came up and as a result the council um, and the planning board uh, through the process did add that. Mm. So um, and that's part of what we're here to do is to try and figure out how's the best what is the best pass forward. So okay. thank you. I just want to say there is precedent for so that. So just so I make uh, yep. the reason I'm asking staff to take a look at this because I, I really want to get a, a handle on the order of magnitude of cost. Um, you know, and, and whether we have adequate space there um, to, to do question. the work. Uh, I believe we do. 
Uh, the right of way. We have look, enough the, of a right of way. Yeah, the right of way looks like it's okay. adequate. Um, so, but you know, I want to make sure we. You know, I'm not speaking out of turn. So. So by the time it comes back to planning board, could that be an add-on where we have at least the figures and whatnot, so that we have a good idea? No. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and, and with that in mind, I brought back the schedule to, to remind folks that on December 21st, we'll talk as a planning board. On January 17th, the, the staff will brief the council on um, what we've learned tonight and, and throughout the process and what the planning board had to share. And so there'll be another poss uh, opportunity there to speak. Uh, February, we'll have a public hearing. There are multiple opportunities to speak, and we can continue to research and find out what this would would. Would we also do a public hearing at public planning board we do on, on december CIP. 21st so hmm. on yeah so on december 21st the planning board will actually get a presentation and um move it forward but there'll be a public hearing piece of it so okay. and i i am the representative on the planning board that's why i'm saying all this okay. <laughs> all right so i'm more than happy to to talk about this once especially if peter can get us all the details on it whether it's feasible the cost i think the planning board can help make a recommendation to try to add it in we'll do the best we can to get as much detail as possible thank you <laughs> i think in lieu of an, a hard and fast number perhaps we mention it in the narrative and work to to provide the number as soon as we can yeah it, it obviously without doing a full design and getting a bid we don't have an actual number but right you know we an estimate it it'll, I, th I always think the hardest part when we're doing these things is whether or not we already have the right away right because trying to negotiate the right of ways is the hardest part so knowing we actually have the property to build this on will be I think a good to know they also to acknowledge that loss of six seven mature sure. trees is a significant issue that will go before trees and greenery? That'll go before trees and greenery. Okay. I think the loss of life would be worse. So I, I think I don't we'll disagree. Trees. <laughs> um, but you know I don't want to diminish uh, the know. role trees play in our in our life. We'll find another place. We planted four hundred trees for the four hundred. Yeah. Councillor. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to Greg and your neighbors all for getting together and organizing. Um, it makes it a lot easier on this on our side, you know, to show that you're all in <laughs> Unison, you'll agree. Um, I know this area very well. I grew up on Greenleaf Ave. Yeah. I used to play with my friends on Hillside Drive, and you know we'd go around the ABC buildings. Um, you know, I coached at the high school. I know several of my freshmen on the football team cut through there, walked to walk to school. Yeah. Um, so I think safety of children and stuff like that. I would hope that staff, council, and everyone involved would try to make this um, a priority as much as possible. Appreciate that. So, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else here wish to speak on anything? I'm thinking Greg did a pretty good job representing the neighborhood, but I don't, I don't want to assume that. Okay, great. So this is a point in the meeting where we talk about um, what if, uh, what are the recommendations that this group might want to discuss uh, and bring forward as part of the process. So I'm going to tee that up to the three counselors, see if there's any thoughts you want to add. And does, would it help to go back to? I think we mostly want to start around the CEIP eligible projects where we started because yeah. Yeah. those aren't currently in the plan and you need a recommendation as to whether or not we want to work to fit them in the plan, correct? Right. Okay. Just make sure I'm in the right place. Well, I think the school really has talked a lot about the air conditioning and they're not, if you guys aren't on board and trying to move forward with that, I think it's going to be awfully hard for us to do it without you. So. I don't know my other fellow counselors, but I. No, I think for it's, now it's right. not it's not feasible. Right. I, I mean, for eight million dollars, you can also raise Prescott Park, and. <laughs> I'm thinking by the time we actually do it, it'll be ten million. So. <laughs> no, I agree. I, th I think it'd be a great idea. I think it'd be great to you know have comfy chairs and everything. Um, but stuff like that, I, I know as a student, you know, um, there are some very hot days. Um, but I'm tending to the recommendation of the school department. Moving on to Maple, I'm sorry, Haven Park Lighting. If I may. Yep. Um, I would suggest we have an existing um, monies identified for parks and uh, cemeteries. Uh, there is some monies that have been identified annually okay. uh, that we use some of that money to do a small, if, do an outreach effort and if it's, if there does seem to be interest that we do a small design charrette of sorts and get you know, input to define what a project would be in that in that park. At Haven Park. At Haven Park. Could, yeah. 
Could we, we actually put that out to flash vote? And get so, just a um, simple I'm, little. I is that a worthwhile a use of that? Limited, has a limited number of. Oh. But they could do a, I think you'd want survey. a more geographic. I was thinking of surveys, whether or not there's, there's interest. Different surveys we could do, yeah. yeah. I was thinking if you could do a survey just to try to find out how much interest there is before yeah, we even get we to look, trying to design with, something. We could work with Monty. Um, okay. And maybe we put a QR code at the entrance of each thing, and as people walk through, it's like interested in, you know, right. park improvements, you know, give us like some ideas. Here. Okay, that'd be great. And then that, that'll help define it, and then... I think that would start the process. Yeah. At yeah. least we'd know how much interest there was, whether or not we even look farther down the road. Yeah. Do we have lighting at Goodwin Park? We have lighting at Goodwin Park, yes. Yeah, actually, some, some new um, pedestrian lighting went in just the other day. Right. So okay. it's... So that's a similar... If you haven't had a chance to go by, you'll, well, you'll probably get by this weekend, so... Yeah. Okay, great. Um, now we're up to Public Art Trust Fund. I'm all for that. I think it's a good idea. Yep. I guess I would look to staff to give us recommendation as to the levels of what would be reasonable financially to start something like that. Um, you know I, what I mean? Is 25000 a good annual amount, or is there another amount staff would recommend? Well, um, keep in mind that there is an existing balance in the public art trust account now. Okay. So the idea I, would be to build upon that. Build I don't know the, top, the number off the top of my head, but... Yeah, no, I think the, um, you know, Christine Dwyer and the Public Art Review Committee for um, recommending this, and I think this is a great idea. Um, you know, we won't miss any opportunities for matching funds and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think it's important that we maintain our, our current art, you know, that we have some sort of plan. Um, With the idea, idea to be to, to place 25 in the next six years, 25 each year for the six years. Yeah, yeah, for a total request. of 150. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And the last one would be the Historic Record Artifact Conservation and Storage Assessment. I think this has come up through a committee. There's been a lot of work on it. And uh, I do like the idea of looking at LCHIP grants for this specific project. Being somebody who writes a lot of, does a lot with putting money into LCHIP grants, <laughs> into the LCHIP program. <laughs> I'm very familiar. I, I think we need to know uh, the scope and, and what kind of square footage and all the work that's planned in, in this feasibility study. So. Right. And is there a location? Yeah, and a location. That is part of the assessment. Okay. okay. That's it's to assess the... Okay. okay. I think the other thing that bears noting is, and something we haven't quite figured out or drilled down enough on, is the formation of a public-private partnership and the roles of the different organizations and, and are the needs the same, and can the city's needs be met in the same way that the other folks can? So I think there's a fair amount of work that still needs to be done in, in, in regard to right. that. Right. But when we're talking private partnerships, we're talking, you know, the Anthony, and we're talking about nonprofit non organizations, yeah. not for profit organizations. I, I and I think there's a I would really. Caution, I would caution you. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of material out there, and we would be taking on a lot of liability and taking on a lot of mm. um, challenges. Managing historic records Doing and or that kind of a partnership. So, okay. To piggyback on that, we just mic. Oh, <laughs> I'm the mic. Sorry. Um, just to piggyback on that, due to legal um, guidelines that we need to maintain, we would have to maintain the ownership and the oversight of all of our items. So we can't hand it off to anybody else. So it would it would the auspices would fall. It would all fall on us. The, the, the challenge. There's a, lot, there's a lot of overlap from artifacts, records. You know, when you start talking records, you get a. The, the, yep. So there's, you know, we understand the need. Yep. And I think it's a, definitely worth, you know, having further, Discussion. having a study done to figure out better define it. Mm -hmm. um, but as the manager, you know, pointed out, it's you know the private public partnership portion of it is needs to be teased out and, I, and, and better understood I, before we. I appreciate the. Input. Yeah. I think it's also important to um, note, and we had we had um, recommended they increase the amount that they had requested. I think even they didn't understand the um, vast amount of artifacts alone in the city, never mind records. The minute they opened it up to records management also, you have 32 departments in the city that all have records. Right. I mean, on top of all facility. of the others, in top, on top of all, you know, the Athenaeum and everybody else who also have a vast amount, so. so. To Abby's point, the committee initially asked for 65,000 for the 
initial conservation assessment. Staff is recommending that number be closer to 150. And even though the group asked for a year two number, I think we're cautioning that it's too premature to know what that year two number is. The, the year two number did come from staff, but our concern was just that the year one number might not be enough to get in the timeline might be more than they had anticipated to get through everything. Mm. So just to kind of revisit, make sure the number is still true in year two next year. So you basically use the 75 as a placeholder, but might have to update it next exactly. year. Exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. I'm, I'm good with that plan. Yeah, I mean, we, just the library's collections alone are, uh, there's a lot of material there that often doesn't, is looking for space. And then the Athenaeum has got overflow and, um, and our own city records, I mean, the, the tax records and maps going back to the 18th century, so. There, there's a need. It's this, this is a significant need. Um, it's just how how do we, you know, yeah. is it a, is it the city's role to provide for those other entities when we can't provide for our, our existing yeah. needs? Yeah. This also doesn't eliminate our need to do some of our own stuff on property. Just to kind of clarify that a little, we still have stuff that has to stay within the building. Yeah. So. No, I agree. I think this is a need. I think the fact that this has come through a, a Blue Ribbon Committee as well shows that we've addressed this as, as the council, the mayor has addressed this as a, um, a priority. So for the purpose of uh, taking notes that, that one of you wonderful people can report back on December 4th, should we place 150 in 25 and 75 in 26? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. I think we also should investigate LCHIP grants towards that on top of it because that might actually make up the difference of what we might be short. Yeah. Copy. It's sort of in the size range for an mm -hmm. LCHIP grant. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we didn't discuss that anyone wants to bring up? Because I think this brings us to. No, because existing projects are existing projects. And I, I yeah, I think that the, the other process for the most of the rest of them are, are in process or, you know. They really should look at parking traffic and safety before they come, or there's the mass, the you know, pike pedestrian plan that needs to be done in connection with the master plan that's being done and all those updates. So I, um, I think we're in the right direction. And just to Councillor Blaylock's question, we did provide everybody that we've recommended parking traffic and safety the link for contact. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure anyone that was felt like, oh, my didn't make it, you know, they're going to have a negative feel, but make sure that we reassure them that, you know, yeah. what direction. And all these go. sheets are posted online. The links are all live. So even like the project pages that we referenced that are underlined, they it goes back to the pages online. They can go look. Okay, thank you. We were yeah. careful to notify everyone who submitted something before we provided this list live to, to, to the public for the purpose of the meeting. So they'd know. Great. Awesome. Thank you. What's our timeline for the revision on the bicycle pedestrian master plan? Next year? Um, the, the RFP should go out in the next week or two, so not later than that. And then um, that'll take roughly a month to get submissions, pick pick a contractor, and then the work will start right after that. So early I'd say 24. By January, February. Yeah. It would okay. start. Start. Yeah. Great. So we could be talking about a draft in the summer maybe yeah I don't think it'll be much more than six months I don't yeah, yeah it's not a whole year process okay and they'll have an input process for that oh yeah yeah and an advisory committee as well oh good yeah. okay yeah. great is there any additional public comment we, we could take in <laughs> well thank you all I think we'll, we'll adjourn for the night and thanks for your input we appreciate the time thank you thank guys. you